Today's program is an MS News and News program. It's called MS Today. This is a new series of programs that we will be doing with the content that will be at today's program will be discussed at other programs around the United States. This is in addition to our other series that we do live called A Compass to MS Care, and that is for those in underserved communities and in rural America. So we do welcome everybody here today. I want to give you all a round of applause for being here. Yay, everybody, do that, great. All right, our sponsors for today, EMD Serono, Bristol Myers Squibb, Horizon, who's a new name in the forum, all right, but Horizon's with an NMO drug. All right, we have Banner Life Sciences. That's a new drug for the MS community, which you'll probably hear about later on. We have Janssen, who has another new drug in the MS community. These all came about in the last two years. Also, Bristol Myers, that I already mentioned, also has a medication that came out at the beginning of the pandemic and is also for the MS community. And then we have our local Infinity Clinical Research, and I hope that you got a chance to stop in and see them. They're in the back of the room, so if you have to stop in later on, I'm sure you could go back there and see them. Okay, so let's welcome Dr. Steingo. Thank you, Stuart, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna talk firstly about the land of MS. So this, this idea um, of the land of MS is something that I did with Stuart the very first time we did one of these programs. And this started out with the idea of if someone is newly diagnosed, and I know many of you, and I don't know if anyone's newly diagnosed or relatively newly diagnosed, it was the idea that MS, talking about MS can be, a, we can talk about multiple topics. And so the topics we're gonna to cover today is just a small example of all the different things that we can talk about when we do talk about MS. So I had this whole idea about the land of MS and all the things you could talk about. Starting out from the very first onset of MS, which is the diagnosis of MS. How do we diagnose MS? Even now, in 2022, we still do not have an actual blood test to diagnose MS. What type of MS does someone have? What are your expectations down the road? So this is a big topic that we always have to talk about. What can you expect when you have this diagnosis? And rule out other conditions. There are conditions that mimic MS that we have to rule out, such as NMO that you heard Stuart refer to earlier. But part of the diagnosis of MS is ruling out other conditions. And then if you look on the right-hand side on top, we'll refer briefly to treatment aspects of MS, treating the disease. That's important. How do we treat the disease? And then what kind of drugs do we have? We will refer to that a little bit. Next, underneath that, you see the symptom tower. In this land of MS, why did we call this the symptom tower? We called it the symptom tower because there are so many symptoms, and we will discuss that briefly as we go along too. But I said there was a tower. To deal with all the symptoms in this land of ours, we have to have a tower. And then underneath that, we had the Department of Nutrition. So diet is becoming something, although it's still very controversial amongst people with MS, diet is becoming an important factor. So we have this whole Department of Nutrition. At the bottom right there, you see the uh, general wellness. Never forget that your MS is part of your whole. You have to take care of your whole person. Uh, we see people, the MS population is aging. The average age of a person with MS in the United States is now 55. So other things start to happen. Musculoskeletal diseases, knees, back, hips, joints, diabetes, hypertension. So all these things, your MS is part of your whole being. And so I came up with this term that I call the health bank, which means just the same as you invest money in your bank account for your future, you must invest money in your health for your future and nutrition certainly is part of that, as is exercise that you've already heard about. And I call it the self-power tower. In the bottom there, the self-power tower. Everything you do for yourself being so important. The team never works if you don't become part of the team. All the things that you can do for yourself. That itself is a lecture that we do just on its own, that topic. And then the importance of social support, research, MS research that's going on. We have a local Infinity Clinical Research where we do some research trials if you're interested in that. The Department of Education, keeping up to date. So what is this meeting? This meeting is a meeting that is part of the Department of Education. We're trying to teach you some things about MS, allow you to answer some questions. Now, of course, there are many places you can look for, re for, uh, for information, but it's always nice to have a live program where you can ask questions. So this is what talking about MS involves, all these topics, and we could pick any one and spend till this evening talking about them. I'm going to now go ahead and, um, this is what Stuart hired me to do today, is talk about specific topics. And so uh, if you have the agenda, 
This was the one topic which was MS, the disease progression and medications. So let's look at the types of disease that you could have. Uh, the commonest type of MS is relapsing or remitting MS, and 90% of people, or 85% of people, start out with relapsing or remitting MS. So now let's look at that arrow. What is that arrow doing? That arrow is swinging around, and it encompasses two types of what we call secondary progressive MS. So people start out with relapsing MS, and we know what happens to people, and we'll go into that in a second. If you have relapsing MS and you're untreated, you can develop secondary progressive MS. But now, in recent years, we've split that into two components. Routine secondary progressive MS is someone that has started to progress without a relapse. They're just progressing. In between their visits, they progress and they don't have any relapses. And then we have this category called active secondary progressive MS, which means you're progressing, but there's still some disease activity that we can measure. You might still have a relapse. Or your MRI scan looks active. We call that active secondary progressive. Finally, at the bottom is primary progressive MS, which is about 10% of people who progress from the very beginning of their disease. Now, if you look at the first two, the top two, we have, let's look at number two first, the clinically isolated syndrome. Initial demyelinating event. Okay, so the clinically isolated syndrome, uh, CIS, is someone's initial episode. We're with our modern criteria, we're now able to say this is likely to develop to MS. But there's even an earlier stage than that, which is called RIS, the radiologically isolated syndrome. And this is something under study too. This is where someone is coincidentally noted to have findings. So someone, for example, might have a headache or a head injury, and they have an MRI scan, and it shows changes that look like MS, but they've never had any MS symptoms. And this may be the very earliest sign that they might, in fact, go on to develop MS. We call that RIS, or the radiologically isolated syndrome. So these are different types of MS. And the medications we use for these might be different too. That's why we consider the types, although some people feel that this is just one big spectrum from one to the other and that there's overlap. And another way of looking at MS is do you have a relapsing type of MS or a progressive form of MS? So when we say a relapsing type of MS, we spoke about the relapsing types of MS. And when we look at the brain and we look at the relapsing type of MS, what we see predominantly is inflammation. If we could look at a piece of the brain, early on with the relapsing type, we see inf a lot of inflammation going on in the brain. But we know that as MS progresses, that more degenerative changes start to occur. There is less inflammation and there is more degeneration, meaning that brain cells may be slowly dying, becoming less functional. But even in the earlier stages of MS, when there is mostly inflammation, there is a little bit of degeneration. And in the later stages of MS, there's more degeneration and less inflammation. And so our drugs are trying to work on both of these aspects. This is a little slide I left in here to define a relapse. Important to define a relapse, which means either a new symptom or something that was there before that gets worse and must last at least 24 hours. I just wanted to mention that part, that for a relapse to be called a relapse, it's 24 hours. 15 minutes of tingling or numbness is not a relapse, it must last 24 hours, and it's very important that there should be no other explanation. That's what I call my Friday night call. Anybody here guilty of a Friday night call? Let's see. Friday night is when you've been feeling bad for three days, but Friday night at six o'clock, it's time to call the neurologist to say you've had trouble walking for a few days. How many days? Started Wednesday, but Friday night, six o'clock is a good time to call you. <laughs> or the middle of the dolphin game is even better. But so first thing to think about always when somebody has new symptoms is, is there something else triggering them off? A urinary tract infection, a cough or a cold, upper respiratory symptoms, any acute thing may give you new symptoms. So we always need to make sure that there's nothing else that's causing your symptoms before we blame it on a relapse. Or it could be due to a medication, for example. You started a new medication for, for your bladder, for antidepressant. Any new medication made you feel dizzy or fatigued or lightheaded. So let's always make sure before we label it as a relapse that it isn't a pseudo relapse, a fake relapse. Because if you have a urinary tract infection making you feel weak and making you have trouble walking, steroids would not be a good solution. So what's the importance of treatment? So how do we know this? We have treatments for MS now. How many drugs? You'll see that list in a minute. Amazing how many drugs we have. But in the early 1990s and before that, we had no medications, and so we know what used to happen to people if they were not treated. And what we found over the years is that about 10% of people have what we call benign MS. They're very fortunate. 
They have minimal attacks and minimal disability. And you can't always predict that at the beginning. But there are people that are very fortunate. You can't really tell that they have MS. They're the people that what Jeff was talking about that look very good. Uh, 10 to 20 percent of people have that type of MS. Then 5 percent of people have malignant, what we call malignant MS, and it's got other names too, but it's people that rapidly deteriorate and they become wheelchair bound or unable to walk in a short period of time. What else do we know? At 15 years after the diagnosis, 50 percent of people have, this is without treatment we're talking about, at 15 years after the diagnosis, 50 percent of people have progressed and at 25 years after the diagnosis, 80% of people have progressed. Well, you could say 25 years is a long time, but if you think of someone with MS being diagnosed when they're 20 to 30 years old, 25 years later, they might be 40, 45, 50, and they're progressing. So this is what happens with our treatment. That's why this is one way we know that treatment is very important. I listed here some risk factors that you can look at. Somewhat, to some degree, we can have some way of trying to predict how your outcome is going to be. So the first thing is the age at onset. Younger age, actually, may be better than older age. For example, a 20-year-old woman who develops MS is probably going to have a better outcome than a 50-year-old male that gets MS. What about the symptoms that you get at the beginning? Very important. If someone has optic neuritis, prognostically not a bad symptom compared to, say, somebody that's first symptom is their spinal cord being involved. It's very different the type of symptom that you have. And then how the MRI scan looks, we'll look at that in a minute. And then how long between the first and second attack? And how many attacks do you have in the first two years? And how much is your recovery between attacks? So if you add all these factors together, we somewhat can have an idea and say to you, you have prognostic factors that are very worrisome and we need to be aggressive with our treatment, more active with our treatment from early on. So we do have some ways of predicting. That said, as you know, very unpredictable disease, some people that could look very threatening from early on, might completely have no problems after that and, and uh, stay in remission. Other people that may start off favorably uh, may progress. So uh, this is some general findings. This is looking at the MRI scans. And this says, can we predict from your MRI scan how you're going to be looking down the road? So what this says is that if you have a symptom, let's take a symptom of optic neuritis. You have optic neuritis and you have no brain lesions. Do you have a chance of developing MS? The answer is yes. Even with that, you have a 20% chance of developing MS. Now, if you have optic neuritis and you have a couple of brain lesions, your chance of developing MS is about 80% or nine or 10 lesions. So once you have lesions, your chance of developing MS is about 80% over the next 10 years. How about the number of lesions? What difference does that make? The difference that makes is to the disability. The higher, num the higher that, uh, if you see that bar going on that graph, the worse the disability. So what we know is that the more lesions that you have, the higher the disability is likely to be in the future. And when we sit down with someone and look at their symptoms and look at the number of lesions on their scan, we can say we need to start out with a more aggressive or what we call a higher efficacy medication. So this is the goal that we have for the future, and it's already something we use in our clinical trials. We want you to have no disease activity after we start treatment. No activity. What does that mean? It means you have no relapses. Top left, no relapses. Top right, freedom from EDSS, worsening EDSS is our disability scale, so we want to stop relapses, we want to stop disability progression, and then the bottom two on this over here are MRI scans. We want you to develop no new lesions on the MRI scans and no active lesions when you get the contrast, the gadolinium. So this is the goal. This is our ideal. It doesn't mean we can always achieve it, but this is what we have in mind when we start treatment. This is something in clinical trials that we are looking at these parameters of showing that you have no evidence of disease activity. So now you've been diagnosed with MS. We've gone through the type of MS you might have. We've stressed what type of medication that we would like to put you on. And I just threw this in over here, and of course this is all uh, going to be on Stuart's, one of the educational sites that you follow, and questions you could ask. Which medication? When do you start therapy? You may have different doctors giving you different advice. Um, are you afraid of needles? Where do you get information? Side effects, how safe, pregnancy aspects, cost of therapy, 
how long do you take the therapy? A lot of different questions that you might ask. I put some of them. There's probably many, many more. Later at the end, I'll show you some other ways of looking at these questions. And here is the list of medications that we have approved for MS. So this is an amazing list. Because if you go back to 1993, if we were sitting here on this same day, April or whatever it is, 9th, is it the 9th? In 1993, how many do you think we would have on this list? Zero would be the answer. Zero would be the answer. Because the first drug that was approved for uh, MS in May of 1993 was beta and then we have, since then, of course, interferons, several of those. The next group that came about was infusion drugs, and then subsequently many oral medications. And so we have a long list of medications, and we need to try and individualize our therapy now. We would look at your situation, your findings, and try and pick the drug that's going to match best for you. But you can see we have a lot of choices now. I put in some of the drugs, some, some new therapies that are coming. So here are some new things that are coming. Even though we have that long list already, here are some new things that are coming. So uh, the first one, ublituximab, is an anti-CD20. And I put that in. Why? Because we do already have anti-CD20s. Uh, those are drugs that uh, deplete the B cells. And we have two of those already. We have ocrelizumab and ofatumumab. So this is another drug in that same family. I put it in there because there's another one coming in that family. A big group uh, where a lot of research is going on now, multiple companies doing research and looking quite exciting are the BTK inhibitors. Uh, and there are multiple ones of these that are going to be coming to MS. Probably you won't have the first one until 24, but there are these, this whole group of drugs that look very exciting. Mesitinib is another one that's been studied in progressive MS. So it has had some benefit in progressive forms of MS. It also works on the same BTK pathway that the others do works a little differently from the BTK inhibitors, but mesitinib is another drug coming. And then, of course, HSCT, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, something that's still under a lot of investigation, hasn't progressed very much since the onset of COVID for a variety of reasons, but that could be something that maybe could become more mainstream in the future. And then remyelination, the big question. Are there medications that can help the myelin regrow? And yes, there are many medications. If you want to look them up, you can always look up information on clinicaltrials.gov. That's the place to go, clinicaltrials.gov. And if you go there and look in for agents for remyelination, you'll see there's multiple FDA-approved studies that are currently going on for remyelination. I put in over here about some of the stuff, some aspects of uh, research. What are we looking at? Neuroprotection. How do we protect the nervous system from future problems? And repair, repairing myelin, maybe repairing nerve cells. Uh, Antilingo was one of the agents used to try and repair myelin. In preliminary studies, it did not meet its end point, meaning it didn't quite meet what we wanted to do, so there's more studies going on with Antilingo. Aging and the immune system. Uh, bottom left, aging and the immune system. Huge topic in MS. Huge topic. Why? Because I told you earlier that the average age of an MS patient is 55. So people are not only suffering the effects of other organs and in in other parts, systems in the body that are aging, but the immune system is also aging. So it has different interactions with all the medications. So very important topic, aging in the immune system. We want to improve. That's our goal. Let's make our drugs safer and more effective. Let's improve symptom management. What about the effect of the diet? How important is diet? It's a huge topic, again, that we could spend hours talking about. And then at the bottom over here in that little rectangle at the bottom, biomarkers. We're looking for some way to mark your disease, to diagnose it. We don't have a blood test still. Is there a test we can do that tells us what, what stage your disease is and what your pro progression is likely to be like? There is something called NFL, neuro, neurofilaments. And there are things like this that we're studying to try and find some way that we can measure your disease, where you are, and where you might head. So that's the end of that section that I had to cover, which was called um, Disease Progression and Available Medications. So we're trying to cover a lot of ground here. If you have questions, we certainly can cover them. The next one is MS symptom management, which as everyone knows, we said before, we have this in, in the land of MS, the symptom tower, because there's so many symptoms of MS. The problem with all the symptoms of MS is what does that lead to? It leads to a few problems. The first problem it leads to is overdiagnosis, because there are so many symptoms. If someone goes, does a Google search or some search, 
They have so many symptoms that MS almost always pops up somewhere. So the number of symptoms often leads to overdiagnosis. That is a big problem these days rather than underdiagnosis. So symptoms that start. How does MS present? Let's just look at this little slide here. Some of the symptoms that can happen right from the beginning, how frequently they are. You'll see that optic nerve involvement is quite common, 14 to 29 percent, depending on which study you look at. But I would say it's one of the commonest of the early symptoms. But it can be anything. Loss of balance, dizziness, weakness, double vision, bladder and bowel problems, pain, sensory loss. Again, there's a long list of symptoms, which is why this condition is often overdiagnosed. And they may occur together. And I listed over here some of the typical symptoms that we have to deal with. So you see a long list of symptoms. I'm not going to go into all of these, but you can see the long list of symptoms, which is why diagnosis of MS pops up. Many things cause fatigue. So someone could have fatigue and look it up, and their MS will show up prominently. So there's a long list of symptoms that we have to deal with, which leads to many problems that we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. But never forget this group of symptoms the invisible symptoms of MS. This is a definition uh, that I took from the MS Society, and they actually have come out with this booklet, which is called, But You Look So Good. So Jeff said, when someone says you look so good, thank them, because it is great to look good. It's nice when someone says that to you, but they don't usually say it in a nice way. You have to judge that. Are they saying it in a nice, complimentary way, or are they just showing a complete lack of understanding of how you feel? So this is what often happens. How many people say lack of understanding of how you feel? Quite a few. Right, how many of you are, have been told that you're lazy? Do I see lazy people? Yes, I see many lazy people. You can do more. You just sit around all day and do nothing. Forget that you've got fatigue and pain and numbness and tingling and blurry vision and your bladder doesn't work. You're lazy, you should go and get a job. Yep, all day long I hear that one. So you could be lazy, you could be not trying, it could be in your head. And it is, actually. But not always. It could be your spinal cord, too. So the invisible symptoms of MS are very important symptoms. In fact, the biggest cause of disability, when a young MS patient becomes disabled and stops working, the biggest cause of disability is not the physical problem. It's not the walking. Because fortunately, we can help walking. If someone can't walk well, they could get a walker. They could get a wheelchair. I have many patients that work and have wheelchairs. They can't stand. They can't walk. They have a van, they go to work. But cognitive problems, easier, di more difficult to measure, and fatigue are big causes. So the invisible symptoms are very important. You saw that whole long list of all the symptoms of MS. You saw the invisible symptoms. How about this group? Secondary symptoms. Because of all the symptoms you have, now you have secondary complications. You fall, the result of injuries, head injuries, brain hemorrhages blood clots, urinary tract infections causing sepsis, anxiety and depression, impairing your activities of everyday living. So the secondary symptoms of MS are very important. And then you have the tertiary symptoms of MS. Because of everything else that's happened, people's lives change. Loss of job, family disruption, divorce, social isolation, loss of independence, loss of self-esteem. And these are all things that we have to deal with that your team has to deal with. But this shows you all the symptoms that we could be dealing with when someone has MS. So clearly this is not, our scope today is not to discuss each one of these, but each symptom that someone has, fatigue, depression, spasticity, pain, uh, bladder problems, bowel problems, dizziness, cognitive function, tremors, walking, each symptom could potentially have medications. So there's a long list of medications that we have to know about. So what's the result of the fact that you have so many potential symptoms and so many medications? This is the result. Polypharmacy. Polypharmacy is someone taking many medications and not always looking at the interactions, which is something I like to do when I, on a simple, it's a simple phone app that I have, if you're putting on a new drug, let's see, let's put in the interaction checker and see how it, how it goes with your other medications. So, Patients may have, especially now we talked about an aging population, people may have other diseases, seeing other physicians, may have more than one pharmacy, a specialty pharmacy, this pharmacy, a compound pharmacy. We need to look at all of that stuff. And then drug formularies and costs change over time. So what are we told? We may want to put someone, we may sit with you in the office for a 45 minute consultation. At the end of that we say, 
we think we work out that for, for you, the particular drug X seems to be the drug that matches what we want to put you on. Drug X is what you like. And then guess what? Big brother, insurance company, you're not, you can't have that. You have to fail you know, a whole bunch of things before you do that. So uh, pharmaceuticals, formularies, um, of course, there's more and more medication on the market. And some people like to have more and more medication. Some try and avoid it. And then also the dose of the medication may vary. As the population ages too, you might require lower doses, different doses. And then finally at the bottom, there should be obviously a regular follow-up if you're taking a bunch of medications. So the risk of all the management of all the symptoms is what we call polypharmacy. Self-power you saw before what I included in the land of MS. It's showing you some things that you yourself should have an understanding of. I'll just go through this quite rapidly, but obviously I, I made an acronym of teams of friends. So you can see each one uh, is like teams of friends. So temperature management, and this is not in the order of their importance, it's just in the order of the way that it fitted into my little uh, story here. Your expectations are very important. When we speak to you about, your, about what kind of MS you have, what, what the medications are gonna do, it's important that your expectations uh, are reasonable. Uh, in other words, that when you take a medication and two weeks later you don't feel better, that you say, well, it's not working for me, as an example. So expectations that we must explain to you. Adherence, taking your medication. Well, it depends what you're taking. So adherence is very important. That's because it's very, when you, especially when you self-administer the medication, it's very important that you take it. And we commonly see problems with people not adhering. Why? Why don't they adhere? Number one, they have side effects. We can deal with that. Maybe let us know about that. Number two, what would number two be reason be? Insurance. The insurance. They ran out of insurance. They've got no insurance. They're uninsured. So I see people like that. Nine months later, they come and see me. Well, why? And they're not on the medication. They're not doing well. Why? Insurance ran out. Call me. We've got things to do to help. There's insurance, uh, there's assistance we can get from pharmaceutical companies, potentially research trials. There's things we can do. When you run out of medication, be an activist, come and let us know. We often have something to figure out. And then the third one is people that just stop their medication because they say, well, it's not, you know, I feel great. I don't need it anymore. So believe me, we see all those kind of things. Mental health, sleeping, the S, the S could stand for many things. Sleeping, smoking, being organized so you don't stress your mind out. Management of fatigue. Uh, food, F is food, or it could be faith, spirituality, relationships, interactions, exercise, news, vitamin D, safety. Uh, so there's many things that, that you work on as, as part of this team, and these uh, taking good care of yourself. So um, the, the question from Jeff is, what do we consider a lot of lesions? More so than number always is location. For example, if you have one lesion randomly in the brain, that may not be very important. If you have one lesion in the spinal cord, the significance of that is much greater than that one lesion in the brain. So it's not only numbers, it's also location. But then as you saw in that slide, even going from having two or three lesions to 10 lesions makes a big difference down the road as to what your disability is. Because the more lesions you have, the greater the chance is that one of those lesions is gonna be in a crucial area. You know, if you have five and now all of a sudden, two years later you've got 10, one of them might land up in the spinal cord or the brain stem. So the more you have, the more likely it is that at some point something's going to be in a crucial location. And then I think the final part that Stuart asked me to deal with a little bit was communication with your MS neurology team and decision making. Uh, obviously very important topics. Uh, this is something I've used for a while. It is, uh, if you do go to the uh, uh, MS, if you, if you go to the website for MS Views and News, you can see this over there. I use this in my office all the time, and I don't know if people ever use it anywhere else, but I use it all the time. And this is a very, uh, this is a part of communication. Because when you fill this form in and you come in to see the neurologist, this is tremendously helpful. It doesn't waste time. So you put down on this form over here, for example, your questions. So when I look at this form, I immediately know what questions you have for that visit. Within 10 seconds of me seeing this form, we're planning, we're planning the visit. We're saying your problem today is your bladder or dizziness or whatever the problem is. It's very important. And then we look down further on, we summarize some of your symptoms, ask you about all your medications. When you fill this form in, 
Uh, this form saves us a lot of time. Time is, time is of value. I do give a lot of time. For those of you who know me, we do spend a lot of time together, but still there's always limits of time. But list all medications. Uh, I do ask people to do that. They don't often do that. Sometimes you know what they write. The same. Anybody here take the same? Anybody here on unchanged? Who's on file? It helps when you put them down, especially your key medications or certainly new medications, and your vitamins and supplements. Are you taking vitamin D? Yeah, I take it. How much? Uh, one pill. You take one pill or two? And you? And you? How much? 1,000 units, 5,000. You know, it's very good to have that kind of information. So for example, if you're looking at your lab and we see your vitamin D level is 20, and you're taking 100 units a day, I know, I, I know what to tell you to take more. So give us the more information you give us, the more meaningful a visit can be. And this is just page two of the same thing. On the top there is what we call, I call that like the, the psychosocial aspects. Are you working? Do you smoke? Do you drink any alcohol? Uh, you know, overall, do you have, how are you doing overall? Do you have any stress? What's the quality of your life? Do we have to help you? Do we have to refer you to a social worker? The National MS Society has social workers that we can refer you to. They'll help you temporarily. Or do we need to find a social worker to help you? All these psychosocial things. And then finally at the bottom, this whole section on review of systems, you can fill it out quickly. It tells me about the rest of your health. And things like bladder problems and bowel problems and do you have respiratory problems or cardiac problems or thyroid problems. Just all the things that we just want to have on file. We might not even discuss those, but I just want to, just want to have them on the record. So you're going to tell us all that information as well. So that's, that's an important part of communication. Making a treatment decision. Sometimes people say, we sit for a long time, we try and make a decision about your treatment. And you might say, how do we, you know, people will say to me sometimes, what would you pick? And I say, it's not that simple. And I call this the wheel of decision making. Let's look at all aspects of the drug. What's important to you? Is it safety, tolerability? So, you know, could you take a drug that might have injection site reactions? Flu-like symptoms, uh, what's the effect of your immune system? Is there any risk of malignancies or cancer with this drug? What about liver problems, uh, heart problems, uh, the rare chance of PML? What are the side effects of the medications? So always want to look at the safety of the medication. More, more decisions to be made. Another decision wheel. Are you staying on your medication? Or are we switching you to some other medication? And then if we do switch you, how do we sequence? If you've been on one drug, it's a very important thing for us to think about always, how do we switch to another medication? And that's called maintaining, switching, and sequencing. And this is, again, some of the things you might think about. The top three are always things that we are very considered of. What's the safety of the medication? What's the efficacy? What's the tolerability? Those top three we're always thinking about. Every time you're taking a new medication, or you're on a medication, and you're saying, is my medication is this the right match for me? Is it safe? Does it have efficacy and is it tolerable? And if it is, you may be on the right path. If not, then these are all the things we might think about to switch you. What, does it, does it, what's the exit strategy? Does a drug work? Does a different drug work differently? Uh, what's the pregnancy plan? So all of these things could be things that we might be thinking about. So we're done. Thank you. I'm sure there are a lot of questions, and if there aren't, then you're forgetting something or you're missing something because you haven't done this for three years or two and a half years. So does anybody have a question? Dr. Sango, thank you very much for your presentation. One thing I mentioned is uh, thank you very much for bringing up HSCT. I had HSCT done in, 2000, in uh, 2017 and in Russia, and it worked phenomenally. And I just wish that we had it here. I wish I had it done right when I was diagnosed, because I would have been much better off. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody have a question? I have a question for you, because I've been hearing a lot about it lately from around the United States. And that is people have been asking how they, if they're not doing better from their own MS medication, and they continuously feel like they're getting worse, and their doctors just don't seem to understand, they've heard about this other thing called NMO. Can you please, you know, just tell us why it's important that a doctor might need to be looking at this? Um, so 
Uh, NMO that Stuart is referring to, NMO stands for neuromyelitis optica. It is uh, in the same family of what we call demyelinating diseases of the brain, meaning there's some damage to myelin and other nerve cells. Um, many years ago, NMO was thought to be just a, a variation or a subtype of MS. That's what it was thought to be many years ago, until they discovered an actual antibody. So they actually have discovered an antibody that causes NMO. Uh, so this antibody actually attacks one of the cells in the brain uh, called the astrocyte and damages it and leads to the complications of this condition called NMO. The drugs that work for MS don't help necessarily. There are some overlap, but many of the drugs that work for NMO, in fact, don't work. Uh, many of the drugs that work for MS don't help NMO. In fact, some of them may be harmful. So m most neurologists that deal with MS these days, if we see a patient at the beginning that has symptoms, we often are going to, right from the day we first see them, we'll do a blood test. That's the thing about NMO is that for NMO, we do have a blood test. It's an antibody test. We can measure the antibody for NMO in the blood. So we're able to diagnose NMO early on. The name is, the, d the, d the disease, as I said, is called neuromyelitis optica. So what it does is it causes myelitis, which means the inflammation of the spinal cord, and optica, which means optic neuritis. So if someone has involvement of their spinal cord and optic neuritis, which are also common symptoms in, in MS, but they have certain characteristics that are specific. And so typically, if we see someone who's diagnosed with MS and they have those symptoms, we're going to always do the blood test for NMO uh, because the treatment is different, so it's important to diagnose early on. Thank you. Also, uh, since Frank brought up about uh, HCT thera or HSCT therapy, what can you tell us about the stem cell treatments that are being provided in the United States in clinical trial? Um, if you, the, the National MS Society actually has a good page that summarizes stem cell treatments, and the stem cell treatments that are effective for MS, scientifically effective, is when they, they do hemopoietic stem cell treatments, which mean using, and, and I know there are other, others here that have had that, using your own stem cells and giving your own stem cells. They will take them out, they will harvest them and make some alterations to them and then inject them back into your body and then hopefully the new stem cells are going to be a healthy line of stem cells and no longer attack you like your T cells and B cells that are already present. Uh, the biggest, the, the, majors, the majors place for research in the US was at uh, Northwestern University. Uh, that program right now is on hiatus or closed or sabbatical. I don't know what happened there. There are, others, there are some other sites studying small studies on, uh, on stem cell therapy. So in the US, actually, it's very hard to get this done currently, and COVID definitely uh, slowed this down because when you have stem cell therapy, for the stem cells to take, at some point, there has to be some suppression of your bone marrow, although that procedure has been considerably refined. Um, so that procedure in the US is very difficult. Right now, you have to enter a clinical trial. So they're doing them in some small centers uh, I don't know which centers are still active. They were doing some at Duke. They were doing some at, in Seattle. And the Northwestern one, as far as I know, is on hold. Um, so that's why people often traveled overseas, like to Russia or to Mexico. Mexico, actually, which is close, much closer. Mexico City, they have a whole clinic uh, that is doing these uh, hemopoietic stem cell therapies and other European countries. It's just always the, day, you know, always the worry when you go there is, you know, how good is their medicine, what, are they, what is their quality control, et cetera. So a lot of people have traveled because it's very hard to get it done right now in the U.S. But the therapy, the stem cell therapy that does work for MS is stem cell therapy, hemopoietic stem cell therapy. You're going to read about other stem cells, umbilical stem cells, and mesenchymal stem cells, and a whole bunch of other things, and there's not much scientific evidence that all of those work very well at this point. Okay, thank you for that. Next question's in the back of the room. When a medication for remyelination is finally approved, and is successful, what can people expect that to do to their current MS symptoms? I mean, Joe, we, you know, until, until we see, have the medication approved, I, I, it's hard to answer that question. So MS, as everyone knows, is called a demyelinating disease. What does that mean? That means that when your immune system, well, we, what is MS? MS is an autoimmune disease. Your immune system, the actual system in your body that is primarily bad is your immune system. And so your bad immune system, your immune system normally recognizes itself. So you have these billions of immune cells floating around and they don't attack our body, they protect it because they recognize our own organs and tissues. Well, here in an autoimmune disease, your immune system doesn't, it fails to recognize self. 
and something triggers it off and it starts to attack myelin. And the myelin is the covering of the nerves. So inflammation occurs around the nerves, the myelin is damaged, and this sets off the early symptoms of MS. Now, what does the myelin cover? The myelin covers the nerve fiber, which is called the axon. Now, if the myelin is damaged and the axon has not been damaged, then we can have, and there's some recovery of myelin, we could potentially get some improvement in function. But why can't we predict how someone's going to do ultimately? Because if the axon is damaged, there is no recovery. A damaged axon does not recover at all. We have nothing right now that is going to restore an axon. So our hope is that we treat early, we stop the inflammation, and we stop the disease from progressing, and then we can restore some function by restoring myelin. But if the axon is damaged, uh, then that is a concern, and so that's why it's unpredictable as to how someone would do. How do we know an axon is damaged? We don't absolutely know. We have ideas by looking at scans. The more atrophy that we see on the scan, the more likely it is that there's more axonal damage. So, so atrophy is a sign that there could be more loss of, of tissue. What are the odds that there's going to be a cure for MS in the next 10 years? You, you never want to be negative. Never want to be negative, but, I, but really I should say I don't know. Really, I would say uh, there was a very famous neurologist, probably the father of American neurology that probably nobody here ever heard of. His name was Houston Merritt. About 100 years ago, he said that the sure way to make a fool of yourself is to predict that there'll be a cure for MS. 100 years ago, he said that. And we're obviously much closer than ever. And I would like there to be a cure while I'm still practicing. That would be amazing, an amazing way to go out to the blast when there's a cure. But I would say right now, it's not in sight. So right now, what we're doing is we know what the damage is. We can do a lot of things to prevent the damage. Maybe we firstly stop the disease from progressing, and then maybe we restore some function with the anti-myelin drugs. But a cure, we have to know what causes it. We know things that give you a risk for MS, like all this excitement recently with Epstein-Barr virus. Right? So Epstein-Barr virus is a virus that likely triggers MS. You are a person that likely has already a susceptible immune system, and you get Epstein-Barr virus, and it triggers it off. So maybe if we find some way of if the Epstein virus is responsible in some individuals, we may be in those individuals able to shut down the Epstein virus or what it causes and stop the disease in those people. So I think the, the reason why you can't answer that question totally affirmatively is because I don't think MS is one disease. As I said previously, there was a time 20 years or 25 years ago when we thought NMO was a form of MS, and we know now it isn't. So I think over time we're going to find that MS really may be several diseases in which there are different antibodies that the immune system generated that attacked us. So can we, can we cure it? Maybe we have to find the different causes before we can offer the cure. Thank but you. We, we have come a long way with all these medications. Thank you. Um, if anybody doesn't have a question, if nobody has a question, I have a question that maybe will be good for you. Are there any biomarkers? Yes, yeah, so I, I did refer to that earlier, Stuart. I said uh, biomarkers is a way you can measure how a disease is doing. Would it be nice, ideally, if you went to see the neurologist and they said, here's your blood test, you have MS or you don't? Like you have diabetes, or you, you know, here's your, here's your blood sugar, it's high or it's low. Or you have rheumatoid arthritis. In most cases, there's a blood test for it. But for MS, we don't have that blood test. So we still don't have biomarkers that can actually tell someone if they have MS or not. What we have is biomarkers, which are signs to the biomarkers. You're going to hear about something called NFL, which does not stand for the National Football League. NFL, neurofilament light. These are chains of proteins, let's say, neurofilaments. And you can measure the neurofilaments. And they're a sign of breakdown of the axon that we spoke about, the nerve fiber. And if they're very high, it's a bad, troubling sign. It means let's be more active with this. And if they're low, you might have a less active course. And then we can measure them over time. So measure, maybe we measure your neurofilaments and they're 50, and we put you on treatment and measure it six months later and it's 10, we know our treatment is being effective. This could be a hope for the future. This is, this is not stuff right now we're using clinically. We're not using it in practice. We still can't use it. But that would be an example of something that's a hope. It's called a biomarker. It's a way of marking maybe your disease activity and how you're doing, how you're responding to the medication. Thank you. And what about MRI? Aren't you using MRI as a biomarker also? As a biomarker? As a biomarker. Uh, the, the MRI was a, a massive, massive advance uh, in diagnosing MS. So I'd mentioned to you earlier that uh, now one of the biggest problems with MS, because the symptoms are so widespread, uh, one of the biggest problems now with MS is 
overdiagnosis. Well, there was a time 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, when it was underdiagnosis, and it didn't make a lot of difference because there were no treatments. And so what helped us diagnose MS much more accurately were MRI scans. MRI scans help us to diagnose MS because we want to look for very specific things on the scans. Because many other conditions cause MRI abnormalities that could mimic MS. Lyme disease, Sjogren's disease, sarcoidosis, aging, migraine, many other diseases can cause white spots on the brain. So the MRI is very important in diagnosing MS and then monitoring over time how you're going to do. So that's the way the MRI scans help us. Thank you for that. Um, during your talk about medications, did you uh, speak about, I wasn't in the room, did you speak about the BTK1s? Yes. Okay. I did you. mention uh, that there are several in trial and we anticipate probably 24, 25 to have the first ones available. Great, thank you. Um, when do you see the next line of drugs coming out? Well, I mean, the BTK drugs is going to be the next really major step in efficacy and those probably won't be till 24 hopefully, or 25. And then I mentioned what other anti-CD20 drug, ublituximab, which is similar to some that we already have. That's probably going to be here soon. Is, is there anything out there that they're working on for correcting cognitive issues? I, I mean, there's a lot of research going on on cognitive issues simply because it's so disabling. Uh, but there uh, is currently no good medication from an MS standpoint. Uh, they've tried, for example, there's, there's actually no good medication for cognitive issues, period. period. So, uh, you know, people buy Prevagen and they buy what, Focus Factor and X Factor and Relief Factor and all this nonsense on TV. And, um, you know, people say to me, I'm on Prevagen, what do you think about it? And I say, you know, somebody's getting rich. That's about it. I don't think it helps very much. But the medications that have been used for Alzheimer's disease have been tried for MS. Uh, like Aricept, uh, two, some small studies did not show any benefit really. They don't help much for Alzheimer's unfortunately either. Uh, so there is no good drugs we have right now because it's not like the cognitive aspect of MS is understood well. It's not like you could say well, it's because of this. Uh, it's a more widespread kind of thing and it's a loss of tissue and it's a loss of cells. So yes, there's research going on, but uh, we don't have any good medication. The most important thing right now for cognitive function is to keep mentally and physically active. So I stress what you heard earlier about the importance of being physically active. There's no doubt there's great importance of physical function on cognition. People, they have studied this very well, is that people that are more physically active, and that doesn't mean you have to go to the gym three days a week. That could mean just that you do exercises, even home exercises, seated exercises regularly, People that do more physical exercises and pay more attention to their diet and well-being have less deterioration of their cognitive function. But we heard that um, UM was going to have a clinical that uh, it was about a cognitive um, issue with, with some type of a pill, that they were going to start a clinical. So that's why I'm confused. Yeah, no, that's good. If they have a clinical trial, everything a we clinical have. clinical trial. Uh, all this, this long list of all the drugs for MS that I showed you, 20 medications that we have, and all the drugs for the symptoms of MS. Remember, every single one of those drugs, and if you add all the drugs up that were on these pages, there's probably 45 medications. Every single one of them had to go through a clinical trial. There's no drug that, you know, the company says, we've got this drug, and the FDA says approved. Everyone must go through a clinical trial. Will you have somebody on the drug? and you compare it to placebo. Or you have somebody in the drug and you compare it to a comparable drug. Every single thing has to be approved like that. So if they're doing a drug for cognitive function and a clinical trial, that's great. I'm happy to hear that. I'll speak to Dr. I'll ask Dr. Ramahan about that. But uh, that would be great if they're doing something like that. That'd be fantastic. They're probably going to compare it to placebo. And I don't, do you, are you in the trial? Are you going to, uh, what, what drug is it? Do you know? You don't know yet. Okay, no, that's good. If there's a trial for something like that, that'd be, that would be great. Anything, anything new would be fantastic. And I mean, there's some symptoms of MS that we struggle with. If cognitive function is one of them. Another one that we struggle with tremendously is tremors. I mean, tremors are a hugely disabling symptom of MS we have no good treatment for. And of course, fatigue. We have some drugs, but you know, we use stimulants, Adderall, Ritalin, Provigil, Ad Amantadine, but there's still some symptoms we're working hard to try and get new drugs for. That's one of them. Okay, next question, two of them, one each. Um, Dr. Sango, um, I've heard that as we age, our immune system doesn't, isn't as active. So does that mean that at some point, maybe as an MS patient, we should stop taking the medicine? 
Yeah, so uh, I mentioned that uh, MS and aging is a very, is a huge topic from a number of standpoints. Firstly, when people are aging, you have all the effects of other organs that are aging. Hips, knees, joints, bones, diabetes, high blood pressure, high, all those things are added, number one. Number two, your immune system is aging. So your immune system is primarily to protect you. Protects you from what? From infections. First line of defense, you have an infection, the immune system protects you. The immune system protects us from cancer. There's constantly some, some organ or some cells in your body that might be abnormal. Your immune system recognizes them and destroys them. And if it doesn't recognize them, then cancer may develop. So cancer is a failure of the immune system too. So as we age, our immune system is aging and it's protecting us less. What do we see in older people? You see what happened with COVID. Older people had a higher mortality and, more, and rate because as we age, our immune system does not protect us as well. Well, guess what? Maybe at the same time as it doesn't protect us, it doesn't attack us as much. So we, there are some considerations maybe that as people age, the MS might burn out, whatever that might mean. It's controversial. Some people say it's not the case. Some people say, yes, maybe it burns out and maybe older MS patients can stop their medication. So what do we consider to be an older MS patient? Because I see quite a few around. What's the cutoff age? Fifty-five. So that's what we say. Older MS patient, fifty-five, and so there are several big studies underway. Well, not really big studies, but several studies underway, looking at older MS patients and saying, how do they do if we stop their medication? This must be somebody who is stable. You're fifty-seven years old. You've had no progression for five or ten years. You've got no relapses. Your scan looks good. We so say you're stable. Maybe we can stop your medication. Maybe. Each person should be individualized, and the studies are going to hopefully give us some answers about that. If you're active, we won't stop your medication. If you're still active, you're 57, but you just had a relapse, we're not going to even talk about that. And every now and then I see a patient who's newly diagnosed, 62 years old, newly diagnosed. That's a whole different group. So the thing about MS, as you know, it's a very variable disease. And so we're looking for some answers maybe that will cover a lot of people, but not everybody. There's going to be people on different sides where we have different approaches. Still going to try and individualize it. Hey, next question. Yes, hi. Setting aside vitamin D, which is crucial for MS, patients should be, you know, having adequate amounts of vitamin D. What other supplementation um, supplements would you have seen have had positive effects, or would you recommend, or that you like recommending? So the question is about supplements. So I think vitamin D uh, is a very important supplement. There's some evidence that in areas where there's where there's low vitamin D, that the risk of MS may be higher. Um, we should still measure vitamin D. We don't want to be in toxic range. There's a study done somewhere in South America where they gave people these massive mega doses of vitamin D. <coughs> Excuse me, I've seen some people try that. Remember, vitamin D is involved also with calcium. If you take too much vitamin D, you might do things with the calcium, and calcium can deposit in your arteries, and next thing you've got you know, problems with your cardiovascular system and things like that. So monitor the level always, and I recommend that people have a range of 60 to 80 of vitamin D, most important vitamin. Uh, the other vitamin that's important is B12. To some extent, that depends on your diet. If you have a vegetarian or vegan diet, you could be deficient in B12. So measure your B12 level, you can supplement it. So B12 and vitamin D are two clearly important vitamins. That's the only two I, I, I recommend that, that things are something that you definitely should be looking at. Uh, there's other supplements that people can take. Um, for example, you could take uh, omega-3 fatty acids and all those type of unsaturated fatty acid supplements. But it all depends on your diet. You can, sup you can get a lot of that from your diet as well if you have the right balanced kind of diet. So that's the only two I, I, I recommend uh, clearly. There's been other work on biotin. There's been work on alpha-lipoic acid. Some of that is unclear. The, the biotin work actually used high-dose biotin. It didn't seem to be uh, ready to do what they meant it to do. There's some small studies in alpha-lipoic acid that seem beneficial. Uh, they're harmless. I have no problem with them. But there's some supplements that people take, like echinacea, that we definitely don't recommend. Thank you. Next question back here. Will there be a test to tell people which MS medication will be most effective for them? So um, the, it's a speculative question. Will there be a test to tell you which MS medication will be most effective? That goes to similar to your question. Will there be a cure for MS? Uh, 
potentially, as I'm saying, I'm thinking MS in the future, we're going to see that there could be different antibody types, like we talked about NMO. It used to be considered to be maybe a, a type of MS or a variety of MS, but we know it isn't. It's a different disease. We identified an antibody for it, so we can do your blood and find the NMO antibody, and we know exactly what drugs to give you. So potentially with MS in the future, uh, we may be able to find out by virtue of antibodies, and then this whole huge field of genetics and genomics where we might be able to look at your pattern, your genetic pattern, your genomic pattern, or your antibody pattern, and then predict your pattern is going to respond to this type of drug or that type of drug. So these are all potentially things for the future that are very exciting, and people are looking about it and talking about it, but we don't have the answers yet, Joe. Okay, so a lot of us have heard that Biogen's patent for Tysabri runs out soon. So um, what is going to be the look with a biosimilar that's trying to come in and be another drug for this? I mean, it's a problem you know, we face in every, every aspect of, of, of medicine is looking at biosimilars and, and generics and things like that. Uh, I think initially the, the experience, the bad taste in the mouth of many neurologists about these drugs comes from the seizure medications. When people were on seizure medications going way back and then they came out with generics, for example, even with the old medication like Dilantin, the initial generics were really of poor quality and people broke out and had seizures. So it left a bad taste for us. But I think many of the newer generics are, are, and biosimilars uh, are much better quality. Um, and so it depends on what basis you know, that they uh, approve it and what, what, how they compared it and, and uh, you know, who the company is. And I think any time a new drug starts, uh, we have discomfort and uh, suspicion initially, and then as time goes by, you start to get more and more comfortable. So, Okay, so going further with this, can you tell people the difference between a biosimilar and a generic? It depends on the structure. I mean, it depends on the, on the structure of a drug. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, you want to give me questions about which drugs you want to ask about? No, just the difference of what... what makes something a biosimilar. So a biosimilar, a, a biosimilar drug is a drug that has a, 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 a very similar structure and it's biologically got the same effect. But it might not be exactly the same medication. So the effect is very similar. Biologically, it's similar. So if you looked at the chemical structure, it might be slightly different. But the way it works could be the same. So biologically, it works exactly the same way. But the chemical structure could be slightly different. Whereas a generic has exactly the same chemical structure. So if you take a drug and you take the, and, and another company makes the exact same drug, that is called a generic. It's the exact same drug. It's a different company making it. How's their factory? Are they, are they good? Whatever. A biosimilar does not have exactly the same structure, but biologically, the effect is the same. So that's the difference. Thank you. So all these questions have helped promote questions. Remember those old <laughs> days, right? Are you recommending people get the second booster uh, for COVID? Yeah. Do I recommend to get the booster? Yes, we're going to do the whole COVID thing in a few days, but I do. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions? Well, then I'm going to end this program and thank Dr. Steingo again. Everybody, thank you again for coming and have an awesome weekend. <laughs> <laughs>